Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming live here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Courtney Friedman. Coming up in our show tonight, the director of San Antonio Metro Health talks about the city's success in flattening the curve. The Salvation Army says this pandemic has created a huge demand for their services and will be joined live by a member of the city and county's economic transition team to talk about plans to reopen our local economy. But first, there are now 1,652 confirmed COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. That's an increase of 39, but of those 39 new cases, 34 are from the Bear County Jail. That means only five are community spread. 848 people are still fighting the virus here tonight, but for the fourth day in a row, no new COVID-19 deaths were reported in Bear County. The death toll still stands at 48. Since this pandemic started, you've heard a lot about the need to flatten the curve. And today, Dr. Don Emmerich, the director of San Antonio Metro Health, says San Antonio and Bear County have been successful and now we're on the other side. But her good news also comes with a word of caution. A lot of people have been asking us, um, is it over, is it over, is it over? Um, well, it's never over. But what we can say is that when we've been talking about flattening the curve, um, we've done that. Bear County has now seen an increase and then decrease in both the number of cases and number of deaths reported. There are also promising signs with another metric they've been looking at, the time it takes for cases to double. Right before the mayor made his, and the judge made the declaration, the first declaration, we were seeing a doubling in positive cases every three days. So just think about that. Every three days, that number was doubling. At one point, our case rates were doubling every two and a half weeks. Now it's longer than that. We're seeing a real slowdown in the number of positive cases that we are getting. And in fact, what we will want to do is anything that goes, um, that slips um, to shorter than two and a half weeks, then that's a little bit of a red flag for us. Even though we've flattened the curve, and that's good news, Dr. Emmerich says our work is not near done. That doesn't mean that we can go back to the way that we were back in December or in November. If we don't adhere to these orders and to the recommendations that we've been so good at following, we're gonna see spikes again. Last week, Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Judge Nelson Wolf issued new stay home work safe orders. And even though some businesses have started to reopen, face coverings and social distancing still required in shared outdoor spaces and inside stores. The orders are in effect through May 19th. Families across the nation are adjusting to school at home amid the pandemic and the Sunshine Cottage School for Deaf Children. Instructors continue teaching online. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how parents are playing an important role in that virtual education. He's in that age group still where his brain is learning new language and new words by the day. Whitney Weaver says it's important to keep her three-year-old son learning during the pandemic. He has bilateral sensorineural hearing loss and he wears cochlear implants. So we were referred to Sunshine Cottage when he failed his newborn hearing screening in the hospital. Gideon Weaver goes to Sunshine Cottage School for Deaf Children along with his sister. Because of the pandemic, he is now learning through videos his teacher uploads online. Today we are learning about flowers. Guys. Holly Mason is Gideon's preschool teacher. She teaches three and four year old children. I record instructional videos every day and then send it to the parents um, so that they can view those videos at their convenience. Mason says teachers are also regularly communicating with parents online. We are shifting greatly to parents are having to take the primary seat. But what parents forget is that they were the first teacher. Parents are the first teacher their child's ever going to have. Whitney says there have been challenges. At this age, it's a little different because they aren't going to just sit down for an hour or more of online instruction. So a lot does shift to the parent um, to facilitate that learning. But Whitney says she's confident that with the resources the teachers are providing, her children will continue to stay on track. With the tools that Sunshine Cottage has provided, we've been able to continue that learning and implement the strategies and um, all of the language targets and everything here at home. For the nine, Tiffany Huertas. 
We are just weeks away from finding out if the Food and Drug Administration will approve an adaptable emergency ventilator created by a local team. We've been following the development of the prototype that operates on a battery and could be built quickly at a low cost. This week, testing will continue on the AEV. A team at Skunk Works San Antonio has joined University Health Systems to test the effectiveness of the machine. A simulator mannequin named Hal is testing the amount of oxygen the ventilator is squeezing out and the frequency. A few tweaks need to be made for the machine to be ready for use. One of the things we're going to do uh, next would be to introduce or make how mimic some of the, the lung conditions that, that you were seeing with these patients to change what they call compliance and resistance of the lung, make it harder to squeeze the bag and make, make sure that the device can actually uh, meet those requirements. After a couple more testing sessions, Skunk Works says it will manufacture about a dozen machines. They're still working to figure out where those machines will be used, but the ventilator cannot be used on humans until it's FDA approved. Zooming out now, there are 32,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases across the state of Texas and 884 deaths. Nationwide, there are 1.2 million cases and more than 69,000 deaths. And across the world, there are 3.5 million cases and 251,000 deaths. For 130 years, the Salvation Army has served our community by feeding families and providing them shelter. But the coronavirus has challenged the organization in many different ways. RJ Marquez tells us how the San Antonio chapter has kept meals and beds available for people during this crisis. When the coronavirus pandemic hit South Texas, the Salvation Army of San Antonio worked quickly to ensure its shelter residents would be safe. They created a plan to continue to assist families and feed the community. That included closing its building to in and out foot traffic to limit the spread of COVID-19. We're not taking the traffic indoors, so we've moved our canteen truck outside. So uh, twice a day, lunch and dinner. Uh, during lunch, we're handing meals out of the truck. Brad Mayhar, spokesperson for the local chapter of the Salvation Army, says they are now feeding more than four times the amount of people than they were feeding before the crisis. They were already serving 50 lunches a day to the homeless or people that just needed a meal. The number was about 100 and then it went up to 120 and now it's you know, approaching 140 a day. So when you put lunch and dinner combined, we're serving about 240 uh, meals a day. The Salvation Army initially didn't serve dinner, but decided to start to meet demand. Weekend meals were also added to the Salvation Army's plate. The response we've received from the people that come by and need help there has been, you know, really overwhelming. And people have been really grateful that we're doing this to them. Inside its shelters, Mayhar says they have continued essential services, feeding and helping families. Case managers are working with residents remotely and electronically, and staff has increased the amount of cleaning and social distancing in the building. We want them to feel just as safe here as they would anywhere else. So we just been really been proactive. I think that's been a big key. Safety has been the number one concern. With safety in mind, some programs have been temporarily suspended. The Boys and Girls Club is closed, but families can still get meals there if they need to. The Senior Nutrition Center is closed, but food is given to seniors living at the Salvation Army's housing location near Woodlawn Lake. Our elderly is among the most vulnerable, so we definitely want to be extra cautious and take our time and, and get it right uh, over there. Right now, the Salvation Army is not taking drop-off donations for the health of its workers and because some stores have closed. Financial donations are needed to help the community. When they do donate, through our website, our local Salvation Army SATH website. The money, it stays local and it helps our local programs here in San Antonio. For the Nine, RJ Marcus. Turning to tonight's Nine at Nine, law enforcement officers pay tribute to a Bear County Sheriff's deputy who died after testing positive for COVID-19. A brown bear spotted in a park in northern Spain for the first time in more than a century. Plus, a look at how communities around the world are being affected by COVID-19. Here's tonight's Nine at Nine. A White House model predicts a dramatic jump in the U.S. daily death toll from COVID-19. According to an internal document obtained by the New York Times, a Trump administration model projects the number of daily deaths to reach about 3,000 by June 1st. The official cautions that the numbers are projections at this point. They're based on modeling for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Back here at home, law enforcement officers from throughout the community paying their respects to a fallen sheriff's deputy this morning. 
Timothy De La Fuente died on Thursday, the same day officials say he tested positive for coronavirus. We knew he was in a dangerous place, but I really didn't expect that to go that quickly. Today's procession came from a decision by DCSO administration to treat De La Fuente's passing as a line of duty death. It's the agency's first death related to the coronavirus. The longest lockdown in Europe is easing for millions of people. Today, Italy moved into phase two of reopening as coronavirus deaths and infections continue to decrease. Four million people, including many factory workers, are going back to work to get Italy's economy back on track. In Germany, hair salons reopened after being closed for six weeks. Customers need an appointment to see their stylists, and in Berlin, they have to fill out a questionnaire before even being seen. Salons are required to leave every other chair open to comply with social distancing rules. Carnival Cruise Line says some of its ships will be heading out to sea again on August 1st. The ships will be departing from three ports, Miami, Port Canaveral, Florida, and Galveston, Texas. But the cruise line is also extending its suspension of service from other North American and Australian ports until the end of August. Take a look at this. At least four tornadoes hit a Mexican town near Puebla over the weekend. These images were broadcast by a local station there. Authorities say no one was hurt. A brown bear spotted in a northern Spanish park for the first time in what's believed to be 150 years. Two filmmakers set up cameras in the park two years ago to record wild animals. The young bear was caught on camera going about his business. Brown bears have been a protected species in Spain since 1973. With the 146th Kentucky Derby sideline due to the coronavirus, an alternative race featuring turtles was put on by Old Forester Bourbon. Eight turtles with names like Seattle Slow and American Tortuga competed. But in the end, a turtle named What the Turtleneck took top prize. Today on Star Wars Day, Mattel is announcing four new dolls to pay tribute to the new franchise. The new dolls were inspired by the character Rey, Chewbacca, C-3PO, and a Stormtrooper. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com, and may the fourth be with you. Can you do, like, a good, the good Barbie pose that they were no, doing? No, I'm not even going to try. It's not, they're not accurate <laughs> at I'm all. sorry you're so upset. Sorry. It doesn't matter what her mood is, Sarah Spivey's here in the building with me, and I I'm feel so very, very excited about happy it. Happy to be here. You Socially know? distancing, Socialist but distancing, you know what else right. makes me happy is you're going to give us good weather news, because I don't like the heat. Yeah, the heat has been really bad, yeah. Courtney, but the good news is we are going to be seeing a much needed cool down. Uh, tomorrow, a cool front's going to arrive, but take a look at the time lapse of the sunset this evening absolutely gorgeous but this is not so beautiful the high temperature today 97 degrees at the airport that is 13 degrees above average and it wasn't just San Antonio that was sizzling take a look at these high temperatures around the state of Texas 106 out in San Angelo Ooh, that is some serious heat but north of Texas up into the Central Plains highs today. We're struggling to get out of the 50s in parts of the Dakotas and North Carolina. Uh, pardon me. That's not North Carolina, Nebraska. A cold front is sitting right there across parts of Oklahoma and North Texas. And that front is going to move on through, making it to San Antonio by about a uh, little bit after lunch. That's when we'll see the potential for one or two isolated showers, but here in San Antonio, we should uh, stay dry for the most part. That front moving through right after about lunch, and then that means that we're going to not have to warm up too much. Our high temperatures around San Antonio, the low to mid 80s, that's it. And then up in the hill country, it'll only be in the 70s, so it should be very nice uh, tomorrow in the afternoons for us. Not like the last few nights where we've been pushing 100 degrees. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at tomorrow's forecast, starting off with some areas of clouds. It should be muggy. You really won't notice much of a change during the first part of the day. But again, that front will arrive right near after lunch hour. 84 for the high. Winds will become breezy from the north, gusting up to 25 miles per hour. Then it should be pretty pleasant in the evening hours with low humidity. Then we'll stay in the 80s for a couple of days before we warm back up by Friday. But another front will arrive just in time of the weekend. This one will be even stronger. Our high temperatures on Saturday only going to be near 77 
7 for the high. Uh, and as far as rain goes, really the best chance is going to be Friday and Saturday with the passage of that second front. Uh, Courtney, Mother's Day looks pretty good, though. We're going to clear out and highs only in the low 80s. Beautiful for mom on Mother's Day. I love that it's just for Mother's Day. That's perfect. Just yeah, in time. It is they deserve it after time. all of this. Like, exactly. You know, helping their kiddos at home. I think so. Thank you, Sarah. Uh -huh, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you, too. <laughs> we'll be back in just one minute. Stay with us. We're answering some of your COVID-19 questions. Welcome back. Every weeknight around this time, we try to bring your coronavirus questions to the experts to get some answers. Tonight, we are joined by my friend Magali Giacano. She is a small business owner of Sweb Development. She's on the city and county's economic transition team as well, and that's a team that's going to give their report to both the city council and the commissioner's court tomorrow. Magali, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. What were the major factors you were looking at as a member of the economic transition team for the report that's coming out tomorrow? Safety, number one, right? So it was just making sure that we were following the, the health protocols that um, you know were suggested also. Um, so that was really our, our main concern and making sure that everybody, everyone was gonna be safe at open. That's the balancing act in this whole thing, isn't it? The fact that you want, I mean, people aren't gonna really come out if they don't feel safe. That's right, they're not going to. And, and so we needed to make sure that we were promoting that all over, right? Not only on the business side, but also on the, on the um, just general community. What are some of the ways that you make that happen? How can you make people, I mean, make people feel safe to come out to your businesses? Well, I think that what we're hoping to do is give um, give really uh, good direction based on sort of what the state has mandated and and great suggestions that I think the city is putting forward um, and really just, you know, hoping that everybody really takes it seriously because obviously what we're doing is working and we just have to continue, right? Yeah. What can you what, what do you hope people take out of tomorrow's report? that, you know, that we just have to continue um, being really, I mean, I know it's, I'm repeating myself, but just continue being safe, right? I mean, continue with the measures that we're putting in place um, and just making sure that, that we're clear that this was something very important and very serious and we have to keep on uh, handling it that way, right? One of the questions that our viewers had are, what are some of the industries locally that have been hit the hardest? I think definitely the tourism industry, um, right? So I would say hotels, restaurants, um, and also I, I think the, um, the health and wellness industry, anything that's very high touch, right? So from spas, salons, I mean, they've closed. Gyms. Yeah, yeah absolutely, all of that. All right, I, did Governor Greg Abbott's reopen Texas announcement change the way the city county economic transition team uh, did its business? Um, did it change at all the way you looked at that transition team since he was very clear that the state supersedes what the local government can do? Um, I think it gave us definitely direction as to what, you know, I mean, what we had to stay within, um, but I think that the that the transition team did an incredible job of um, you know balancing that and bringing to 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 the forefront things that San Antonio has been doing already um, as wonderful suggestions to continue doing. Are you worried? That I'm talking. There's a personal business person entrepreneur question. Are you worried that San Antonio's economy will never be the same? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a super optimist, um, and I I think it's going to be a slow, you know, climb back up. But I have no doubt that we're going to 
we're going to find our way out of this and, and we're going to really end up okay. I don't think it's going to be quick. I don't think it's going to be something easy, but I think we're going to be okay. I want to talk about Swab development now and how you are literally a business that have ri that has risen from the ashes. I mean, a lot of people are going to remember there was a, a huge fire on South Flores. I mean, it's a building I've been in before. It's a it was a great building that you guys took over and then it was gutted by this fire. I mean, how has your business been recovering from that? Well, amazingly, um, you know, this was a Friday. The fire was on on Friday morning at 10 a.m. And on Monday at 8.30, we were back in a new office because of the generosity of um, the community. And specifically, uh, Western Urban Randy Smith sent me a text message and he said, you've got a space, how many people are you? And that morning at 8.30, we had desks and chairs in an incredible office space. Um, so we didn't skip a beat, really. And that was very fortunate because of the type of business that we have. As a digital agency, everything was on the cloud. Um, and my team was and is absolutely the most resilient, strong um, team ever. And we just moved forward. Um, so it didn't take much. I think it was much more of an emotional uh you know, shock of it all. And and then two weeks later, COVID happened, so. It's been a whirlwind. And you, <laughs> where, so where will you, will you stay at the at the Weston Center? Is that where you're at right now? Will you stay there or will you look for a more permanent place? We're actually Caddy Corner. Um, we're at the old, uh, I believe it was the old, um, Fraud. It's the it's a little short one anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think we're going to stay there for a little bit. We have to. We don't know. I mean, at one point, right before COVID, we were like, okay, well, we're going to figure out what where we're going to go and what we're going to do. And I think at this point, we're like, we're not even sure, right, what our next step is. So we we want to figure out how to rebuild where we were because we love it and we love Southtown and we're you know huge believers in sort of that area. And um, but. It's a big project. How did that lead to in this together? Did it have a factor in you wanting to do something for a community that had given you so much? For sure. I mean, I, so two weeks after the fire, we actually decide to self quarantine. So we started even before the city mandated um, work from home. And uh, like a, a few days later, I, I was so, I was in distress, like, how can I help all these people that have helped me? And I literally woke up on Friday morning, like week three after the fire, and I was like, I've got it. You know, everybody's asking for gift cards, but I can't, I can't personally buy enough gift cards to make a, a dent in anyone. So how can I do it? I'm just going to, you know, sell something and then hopefully people will buy it and then I'll buy it in bulk and explain, give back. Explain what is the In This Together drive. So basically we've designed t-shirts, masks, and stickers. And uh, people can go online to inthistogethersa.com and you buy. And 100% of the proceeds goes back to the local business uh, food and beverage, and then health and fit fitness. And um, I buy gift cards in bulk. And so we've already distributed close to $50,000. And you've raised? 110. Wow. In, in, in 12 different cities. That's great. That's great. Thank you for that. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I appreciate you joining us. It's always a pleasure. And uh, give my best to your husband. I will. Thank you so much, Steve. All right. Take care, Magali. All right. Good night. Take care. We'll be right back.
As we learn more about the new coronavirus, we learn more about its effect on our bodies. And University Hospital is seeing a troubling trend with young people who test positive for COVID-19 and end up in the hospital. They are at risk for developing deadly blood, clot, blood clots. University Hospital says so far, no one with COVID-19 has had a deadly stroke there, but nearly all the patients have had some form of clot in their arms and legs. They are healthy, they don't have a lot of complications or um, medical conditions. So it's a bit unusual to see these uh, complications in young, young people. University Hospital now regularly uses heparin to treat COVID-19 patients. That's a blood thinner. They also screen patients for blood clots when they're admitted and throughout their stay. Turning to tonight's top stories, a fourth resident at the Frank M. Tejeda Texas State Veterans Home in Floresville has died from COVID-19 complications. The Texas General Land Office says five other residents that tested positive remain hospitalized and five others are still at that veterans home. Everyone at the facility has been tested. A total of 14 residents and eight staff members have tested positive. The carpenter who spent more than two decades making crosses and bringing them to sites of mass shootings and other U.S. disasters has now died. Greg Zanis had recently been diagnosed with bladder cancer. Zanis established Crosses for Losses as a tribute to his father-in-law who was shot and killed in 1996. Since then, he set up crosses across the country, including at the mass shooting in Sutherland Springs in 2017 and at the shooting in El Paso last August. Back here at home, one in five likely voters admitted to having bought more toilet paper than usual amid the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to a new Bear Facts case at Rivard Report poll. That number may seem low given the reports and photos on social media of toilet paper hoarding across the country in recent months. Well, with a lot of people staying at home, many have been spending time on home projects and beautifying their front lawns. But as the weather heats up, making sure your grass and plants survive the summer heat won't be an easy task. Last year, RJ Marquez spoke with a conservation specialist at the San Antonio Botanical Garden. He shares some summer lawn maintenance tips in tonight's Adulting Hacks. All right, guys, it's time for another Adulting Hacks on KSAT's News at 9. And joining me now is Gary Poole. He's with the San Antonio Botanical Gardens. What do people need to know about just protecting their landscape? If you want to protect your landscape, like with anything in your home or anything in your life, you've got to do some planning. It's better to choose plants that tolerate alkaline soil, that tolerate very thick soils in this part of San Antonio. It's Blackland Prairie soil underneath, a lot of clay in that soil. So they need to be plants that'll do well in that kind of alkaline, gummy, clay-rich soil. The best grass for this area is probably zoysia. It tolerates shade, it takes less water than, than Bermuda grass, and it's also much more disease and, and pest resistant than, than St. Augustine. What are some common mistakes that you've seen? You've got bushes and perennials and trees and beds. Those don't need to be watered by your sprinkler system. That's a mistake. The second mistake is to mix plants that have very different environmental requirements. Make sure you pay attention to the requirements of the plants you bundle together and make sure you water them appropriately. Anything final that you would want to uh, share with our viewers? If you plant plants that are native to this part of the world, you will have in the ground plants that can succeed given the extremes of our weather. There'll be a, an attractive component of your landscape without all the work it takes to keep these plants with the shallow roots alive. Good information. The San Antonio Botanical Garden is one of several spots that reopened over the weekend in the first phase of Governor Greg Abbott's reopen Texas plan. But there are several safety measures still in place there. You have to reserve a ticket in advance online at sabot.org. The garden is limiting capacity to 25% for the time being. Visitors are also asked to wear face coverings and stay six feet apart. Hi there and happy May the 4th and with May the 4th happening today, guess what? Tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo and a lot of San Antonio restaurants are offering 
deals on margarita and food that you can take home with you. So some of those restaurants include Taco Cabana, La Gloria, and Torchy's Tacos. Now I saw on the website, if you go on kidsite.com right now, Taco Cabana has an exclusive deal for you and that's for a gallon of margarita on the rocks. So you can check out that deal right now on kidsite.com. La Gloria has a great food deal for two people and Torchy's Tacos has a taco kit and margarita kit to go. Check those deals out right now on kset.com. Next up for you on kset.com, we have a rare real estate gem, multi-million dollar property that's for sale right now in Terrell Hills. If you have the money, this is definitely a dream home. If you don't have the money, this is still a dream home to look at. Uh, now this property is at 720 Ivy Lane. It's four, nearly four acres and this house is nearly 13,000 square feet. It's huge. Seven bedrooms, seven bathrooms, two and a half um, of the smaller bathrooms, a half bathrooms. It has everything. And you can check it out right now on kset.com. I don't want to spoil too much, but it is gorgeous. It has a pool, it has a clubhouse, and lots of gorgeous trees on there. So check that video out right now on kset.com. And last up on kset.com, a lot of us do our shopping at HEB for groceries, but the retailer is giving back to students now by having a Texas-sized graduation. Now, they released a video kind of showing what the graduation is going to be about. They're not releasing a lot of details. What we do know is that it's happening on May 20th at 7 p.m. There's supposed to be a lot of special guests, and they have put out this trailer video for you to check out. We have that video on kset.com. You can see it right now. Courtney, thank you for having me. Have a great one. Oh, the Tiger King. Thank you so much for watching the news at 9. Nightbeat starts at 10. See you then.